a tutti, and welcome to another edition of Italian America Long Island. My name is Dave Anthony Sette Ducati. Today, we have a very special guest with us, someone who is very proud of his Italian heritage and also very proud of all the accomplishments he's made in his career. I'm talking about Town Supervisor Patrick Vecchio. He's been a supervisor since 1978, which makes him the longest serving town supervisor in New York State. He was assistant director for the investigations uh, department of the New York State Tax uh, Department. He was also a detective sergeant in the New York City Police Department. He's an Army vet and he also has a degree from St. John's University. Well, Supervisor Vecchio, welcome to the show thank and you thank you. Me. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your Italian heritage? Well, uh, my mom and dad were both born in Italy, came here at a very young age. My mother, believe it or not, six months old. My father was six years old. And um, of course, they immigrated to the Lower East Side, where I was born, on Mulberry Street in Kenmare. And uh, my father was in the Italian cigar business. At one time, he had maybe 20 people working. You know, certain people would put the cigars in the box, and others would be putting a band on it. And of course, then there were the people making the cigar. Uh, a very unusual process. The cigar would come out like a wet noodle, be placed on trays, put in the room with, it must have been 150, 60 degrees in the room, where they semi-dried, then they were taken out, <coughs> then put in boxes, and put in another room, which was maybe 80, 90 degrees, and that's how they got their hard shape. And the tobacco was from America. The tobacco, the tobacco came from Tennessee. My father would go to Tennessee to buy it. What? So I spent a good part of my life um, in Little Italy uh, because we, I worked with my brothers on weekends and summers. Uh, we would put my father with the cigar business. And uh, that's so much part of it, but uh, my Italian heritage is uh, I'm fiercely Italian when I need to be very protective of it. And uh, we'll fight to the end to protect it. Wonderful. Do you recall what uh, area of Italy your parents came from? My father was born in Sicily. Um, my mother, we're not too sure because she came at six months old and uh, didn't have too much background. But I think she was born in the uh, uh, Provincia di Basilicata. Basilicata is where my parents, uh, parents were from, yes. Basilicata. They were from a little town called San Fele. Um, exactly, my my mother also. I think it was Santa Felice. Santa Felice, the same town. Same town. I think it, this is an amazing <laughs> coincidence. <laughs> wow, you know, there's a uh, San Felice uh, society in New Jersey. Oh, in New Jersey, and uh, that's uh, that's a wonderful coincidence. Um, and do you know what area of Sicily your father came from? Uh, yes, Catania. From Catania. It was a little town called. Uh, Lingua Glossa, or GL, not GR, uh, which means, uh, as you know, lingua in Italian is tongue, and glossa is tongue in Greek. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, because Sicily has had so many so much, different yes. uh, cultures that, that were there. Um, have you ever traced your ancestry? I have. And it's interesting we started off with the Greek. Uh, uh, the DNA indicates that I am. 40% Greek and Italian. 40% Greek and Italian. It's right. a large, large percentage. Right. I know when you right. do those things, there's so many uh, factors that can be in there. So 40% Greek and Italian. Yes. And uh, uh, did you, uh, uh, besides that, do they actually go back and tell you any names of people or they trace it? No, I did not get any of that. No, I just got percentages okay. of the ethnicity. Okay, wonderful. I wanted to do that too. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing. Now, would you say that you were raised in an Italian household? Yes. And what, what would be the... But very American and very English. My mother spoke fluent English, as did my father. Educated here in America. But uh, the customs were Italian. The, um, 
the diligence in celebrating holidays was always family. Um, it's interesting to tell you that we did not sit down to dinner until 7 o'clock when my father walked through the door. And there was no eating before that, and there was really a family style dinner. My father would take an apple and peel it and give each child a slice. Or uh, if you remember the Drake's pound cake, we would slice a piece and give it to each of us. And so there was no, um, every holiday was family. And so there was always that great family tie. That kind of ended as we go, grew older and we had to go play basketball games. So of course, Sunday I have a basketball game. I'm not going to be at Sunday dinner. And that was kind of, a, not the breakdown, but the ability to at least not adhere so strictly to the rule. So as you were getting older. Yes. Do you have the large family? Uh, my mother, we had uh, five children. My mother, uh, four boys and one girl. Oh my goodness, she must have been the princess. Oh, yeah. Well, in a way, she was a twin. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Are you the eldest or...? Uh, no, I was the second eldest. The second eldest, okay. And uh, I know the eldest boy in the Italian family holds a very special uh, place. Did they treat him very special? I don't think so. I don't recall. I think we were all treated very much equally. Uh, not that he was the oldest, that he had any special privileges or anything like that. No, no, that did not happen. That's wonderful. Yeah. How about the uh, the meals that you had? I know you told us about the apple and the pound cake. Did your mother primarily cook Italian? Yes, and it was just, oh, it was. I think. No, I don't think I know that it was. Um, each day of the week was repeated. So, um, for example, Thursday night was. We say pasta now, but I don't like that word. I prefer macaroni. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, maybe a Monday was chicken soup chicken. So each day had a special meal. And it was adhered to. It was adhered to. Now did you help your mother uh, cook at all? No, but I, I learned from her. I watched how she cooked and I, so I can cook somewhat. Okay. And what was uh, one of your favorite meals that your mom made? Well, you know, I think about my time in the army. I miss my mother greatly, but I miss my macaroni. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, um, what what Italian traditions did did your family maintain? Well, I, I don't know if he, we, you can call it maintaining a tradition, but certainly Christmas and New Year's were days of family. We celebrated them with my uncles and aunts all together, and uh, each of those days was a holiday. Even New Year's Eve was dinner in a special way with all of the family. Wonderful. So your aunts and uncles, did they live in the same area? In the same area, yes. For the most part. On my father's side, yes. Okay, on your on the father's side, in, Mo in the Mulberry Street area. Well, no. They all moved. They all immigrated to Brooklyn. Okay. But on my mother's side, they did remain on the Lower East Side. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Okay. Uh, who were your favorite Italian relatives as you were growing up? We were talking about your uncles. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, oh, well, it's hard for me to uh, think each one, you know. Each, I have a certain memory of each one. Certainly, I had an uncle, Joe, who was a barber, who would come to my mother's apartment. And we lived in an apartment house. And I always remember him bringing me Hershey bars and baby boots. And then I got my hair cut. Oh, my goodness. And he was a great guy. And my uncle, Freddie, whose real name was Ignacio, and uh, which means Ignatius, as you know, uh, he was a cab driver, had his own cab. Uh, interesting in today's world, you know, a medallion for a cab sells for about a million dollars today. He had one of the original medallions, he paid ten dollars for it in the days when they allowed him to sign up for it. So uh, he spent his uh, whole life driving a cab, but an uh, owner, owner occupied a cab, so. He was a businessman in his own way. Absolutely. That, that's wonderful. So now, uh, is your first name Patrick, or is it a more Italian? It's interesting. No, my first name, I, I don't know how it happened. <laughs> Excuse me, but my birth certificate says Frank. Frank Patrick. And I have a brother named Frank, so I don't know where the mix-up was there. So I've never used Frank. I've always used Patrick. 
I cannot believe the coincidences because in my family, my birth certificate is Anthony Sedicati, but they, my father was Anthony. I have uncles named Anthony. I have cousins named Anthony. So my mother always called me Dave. <laughs> my brother, his name is Michael, and uh, we have uh, so many Michaels in the family. He was called Paul. So it's another similarity. Yes. I guess it was yes. kind of common in, in Italian families at that time. It was interesting. My brother, who was a, who was named Frank, never called him Frank. Called him Junior. Mm -hmm. And so, even today, I call him Junior. Junior, right, right. That's another very uh, big tradition because I have friends uh, there uh, from Sicily, and of course, the the elder brother is called Junior. Yes. What values were imparted to you? as you were growing up that you would say were particularly Italian? Well, see, I don't know. I can't uh, ascribe it to being any ethnic uh, group, but I would tell you that we were taught honesty. It was, uh, my father was very um, stressed on that we had to be honest in all our dealings, whether it was school or any other dealing, we must be honest. Oh, God bless him. And he lived his life that way. That's the primary thing. Yeah. If you start with that basis, I don't think you can ever go wrong. No, much. I don't think so. Do you currently maintain any Italian traditions in your own family? Well, of course, we still cook Italian. I cook Italian. Um, my wife cooks Italian. And if you call that a tradition, then that's the tradition. Right, wonderful. What's some of your favorite dishes to make? Well, I'm a macaroni guy. Uh, certainly, that's my favorite. Um, I do play around with um, a pasta fagioli and uh, lentiki and things like that. Wonderful, wonderful. Have you ever had uh, the uh, arancini? Uh, tell me, this arancini is, is that not orange? Is it? It's, no. it's it's okay, it's little orange, but it's the rice ball. Yes, it's of course. Of rice course ball? Yes. Okay, that's uh, something that was a specialty in my wife's family, and. Uh, uh, the other one that uh, was a specialty that my mother-in-law made was the garduna. Well, you know, it's interesting because I never heard of that until about four or five years ago. Someone told me that the market of Giuseppe's was sold or sold it, but I had never heard of it. Never heard. I had never heard of it in my family, but my family is from Basilicata, as yeah. right. yours. So I guess it was more a specific Sicilian yeah. tradition. Yeah. I know uh, my uncles used to make something called jambotta. And I don't know if you ever heard of that. I thought Jumbo was everything thrown together. Yeah, yeah, yes. exactly. And that, that's what they used to sure. make. Yeah. And uh, we, my uncle tells a very famous story of uh, how his father, my grandfather, had raised a pig. And they lived in Belmore uh, in the 1920s, which was like living sure. in the middle of the country. And uh, they had raised a pig and they slaughtered the pig and they made the sanguinach. I've heard of that. My friend had that um, once offered it to me in his house, but I don't think I wanted to taste it. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, as we know, is pig's blood, right? Right, pig's blood made into, a, into a, a, some kind of a sausage. No, sanguinach was more like a pudding. Oh, it was like a pudding. Yeah, it was That's like right. a chocolate pudding, but it was made with pig's blood. Right, the, the blood pudding. Yeah. Yes, wonderful, I guess, for those who like it. Have you ever traveled to Italy? Sure. Oh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, my most recent trip was uh, about five years ago, and it was to the Amalfi Coast. Uh, I had been there once before um, looking for neighbors' relatives in Amalfi. I, but I was unaware. I was young, so I wasn't aware that Amalfi was this special place then. But of course, in recollection, I now know that it was. And of course, in visiting it, I recall that. Um, uh, I've been to um, Rome, of course, and Naples, and of course, uh, um, uh, Venice, the, the usual thing. Do you have a, a particular place that you like the best? No, I just think Italy is lovely. It's it just, uh, well, Amalfi and Positano, they're just fabulous places. Yeah, wonderful. We, we were there about four years ago, I think, and we, we, we did a tour. Of Italy. So we went to all of these little places. We were there for uh, 16 days. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to go to the little villages like San Fele or to uh, my wife's 
uh, family came from Petrolia Soprano, which is outside of Sopr uh, Palermo. We didn't get a chance to do that. Sure. Did you have an opportunity to go visit any ancestral? I did. I went to a, um, this a small little uh, town called Lingua Glossa, and I uh, went to see the graves of my uh, grandfather and grandmother, whom I never met. I really never had grandparents. They either passed on or went back to Italy. And I went there to see the uh, the tombs. They don't, you know, um, they're not buried in the ground like we do. There's kind of always something above the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, interesting enough, uh, you would you would enjoy this. My grandmother's name was Signorina. That was her first name. She says we all know means Miss. But why she was named that I don't know. But I never had the advantage of meeting them. They had returned to Italy. Um, my mother's parents I never met, except I guess my grand, my maternal uh, grandfather. Is that, is that correct, maternal grandfather? Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, I do have recollections of him. Okay. Um, but that's about it. Yeah, my grandparents were very old too. Yeah. Uh, so when I was a young boy, uh, my grandmother died, and also my grandfather. So I, I was six or seven years old. Um, the interesting thing when you say that they returned to Italy. So these are your father's parents? Well, that's the story I was told. That they uh, had immigrated to America. Um, and my father and his brother, Freddie, were taken by an aunt to Manhattan where they were lived in the cause of the ghetto. And uh, the story was that they conceived a child here, Uncle Joe, who had very ill and they were advised to go to a warm climate. I don't know what the illness was. Of course, they went back and never returned. Did your parents ever visit Italy? No. My father had no desire to go see where he was born. That's very reminiscent of my family. Yeah. My grandfather and my grandmother, who uh, emigrated from Italy, for their 50th wedding anniversary, uh, they were offered a trip to Italy by their children, and they turned it down. Yeah. They said, no, we don't want to go back there. Italy was not good to us. We are Americans. We love America. And of course, you know, my mother never ever got to Italy or thought about it. She came here at six months old. And uh, I can tell you something very interesting, uh, which I think your viewers would like. Um, my mother never was a citizen. And all she wanted to do was vote. So when I think of Mr. Trump, my mother would be scooped up. Oh. Yet she gave three sons to the military. And the reason she wasn't a citizen, they did not know which ship she came on, obviously. Uh, the mother never did that. Uh, they couldn't find the birth certificate. And all she ever wanted to do was vote. And uh, finally, when she reached about age 70, she became a citizen. How proud. It was a sad story. But she was American. My mother did not speak Italian. She was six months old, so of course she spoke dialect, you know, what she learned from the ghetto. But, uh, and that was, when I think back now, it was very sad that she could not vote. That's all she wanted to do was vote. That's some story. And uh, Ms. today's world, Mr. Trump would have scooped her up. I know, and sent her right back. <laughs> and, uh, how, how foolish was she? She's, she's not Italian <laughs> really at all. Right, not at all. 100% American. Not all, right. That's a wonderful story. I mean, for, for every immigrant, there's, a, there's almost a heartbreaking story somewhere. Well, you know, when you consider that you're leaving uh, two boys behind, and uh, the young one also, or the young one went back with them, uh, you know, 17, 18, in the middle of a ghetto, in those terrible apartments, uh, I think that's a little tough. Very tough, very tough. What courage they had. Yes. What courage. Uh, do you have any plans to return to Italy? Well, I would like to go to Tuscany. I do know that uh, I've been to Florence, which is Tuscany, and the name Vecchio is prominent there, as you all know. Well, there's the Ponte Vecchio. And right? Palazzo Vecchio, right. which, which was the palace of the Medici, as you all know. Yes. So, uh, there was just a movie about ten years ago, Hannibal, mm -hmm. where the, uh, the assailant, if you will use that word, hangs the detective out the window of the Palazzo Vecchio. You may remember that movie. Oh, I remember. With uh, 
Anthony Hopkins? That's correct. That's, that was a great And so, movie. yeah, said, well, that's my palace. <laughs> okay. How has uh, your Italian background influenced you in your profession as a government leader? Has it had any impact on well, you? Well, if you go back to what my father always taught us, you have to do what's right. I think that's helped me in my political career. So I don't de deviate from that. Um, you know, uh, Shakespeare once wrote, to thine own self be true. If, the, if you are, then you'll never be false to anybody. I try to follow that and have done that for all these years. It's wonderful. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to share about oh, your a little, a little vignette, I guess. Uh, uh, oh, yes, Uncle Freddie, who was uh, eight years old when he came here, uh, what it was like at Ellis Island, and he said, uh, they gave sandwiches only to the kids. And he said to his aunt, who, who come to him here, he said, well, let me see what they gave you. And he opened it up, and it was Swiss cheese, of course, which she did not know, Swiss cheese. She says, don't eat it. The rats ate it because of the holes in the cheese. <laughs> so I talk about being educated. <laughs> That's so he always told me that story. That's a great little story. Yeah. That's a great little story. Do you have any other memories of your family that you'd like to, to share with us? Well, only that they all were hardworking people and dedicated and fiercely American. Fiercely American. You could not say a bad word about America. So this became their home. And I recently read about the, uh, well, I guess it was the start of the Mafia and how they all had immigrated to the Lower East Side. And they lived in these ghettos, terrible conditions. And I remember some, some of those conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. Because I visited my aunts and uncles. Uh, my mother and father never talked to them. Never talked about it. You know, the heat in the summer, <coughs> excuse me, and the cold in the winter. Mm -hmm. So they were terrible conditions. I remember staying over uh, my aunt's home, apartment, if you will, and my cousin said, we got to get up and get wood. And we went out into the streets, you know, my street, moment, and scavenged the uh, crates, boxes of that were once used for, for food, and uh, bring it home and put it into the uh, little pot belly stove in the middle of the apartment. And how far we've come. How from far that. we've come. Right, and now we have uh, so much of the blessings that uh, America has to offer. Oh, yes. yes. And, uh, you, you know, I've interviewed a lot of uh, uh, people who've immigrated from Italy, and every one of them is, as you said, fiercely American. Yeah. It's, there's something that American, America offers that Italy cannot, yeah. unfortunately, uh, and uh, I hope that maybe someday the uh, Italians will have the same level of democracy and opportunity that we yeah. have, but uh, it, it's certainly the opportunity that you find here in the United States. I remember reading that after World War II, uh, the uh, soldiers were offered re-enlistments. The, the group of people who did not re-enlist were Italians because they wanted to give back to their families. True. Family is everything. Yeah. Family is everything. Well, this has been wonderful. I want to thank you so much for, thank you. for coming to talk to us about your family and your heritage. Right. And I want to wish you the best. Thank you. And uh, hopefully you, you'll get that chance to go and see that uh, Palazzo Vecchio. I've seen it, bro. I won't mind seeing it again. All right, and enjoying some of the Tuscan countryside. Thank you so much. Thank you much. so much. Thank, Thank you. you. For over 60 years, from 1892 to 1954, Ellis Island was the busiest immigration processing center in the United States. Over 12 million people passed through Ellis Island, including my own paternal grandparents, Vito Michele and Rose di Lucia Sette Ducati. Their names proudly appear on plate 755 of the Wall of Honor. Immigration officials reviewed about 5,000 immigrants per day during peak times at Ellis Island. Today, over 100 million Americans, about one-third to 40% of the population of the United States, can trace their ancestry 
to the immigrants who first arrived in America by way of Ellis Island before traveling further to points all over the country. Usually, immigrants spent from two to five hours at the processing station. Arrivals were asked 29 questions, including name, occupation, and the amount of money carried. The government wanted to see between $18 and $25 so that the new arrivals, in the jargon of the day, would not become a public charge. They were also given a brief but important medical exam. Those with visible health problems or diseases were sent home or held in the island's hospital facility. About 2% were denied entrance to the U.S. and sent back to their countries of origin for reasons such as having a chronic contagious disease, criminal background, or insanity. Ellis Island was sometimes called Heartbreak Island or the Island of Tears because of this. Uniformed military surgeons performed the medical exams, which included the use of a button hook to check immigrants' eyes for diseases. The doctors would watch immigrants climb the stairs from the baggage area to the Great Hall for difficulties in getting up the staircase. After the exam, doctors used chalk to write on their clothing different code letters for various medical conditions. Some immigrants supposedly entered the country only by surreptitiously wiping the chalk marks off or by turning their clothes inside out. Today, Ellis Island has become the Ellis Island National Museum of Immigration. Visitors can take self-guided tours in which the immigrant experience comes alive. They can also visit the American Immigrant Wall of Honor. Look for your ancestors there or have their names inscribed on the wall for a nominal fee. God bless America.